the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Good. All right. You guys good? You look good this morning. Um, yes, I'm drinking my water out of one of the brand new cool SRC uh, mugs that you can have, you newcomers, if you fill out the welcome card and connect it in. And also for you people that have been here for a long, long time um, that lie and fill out a welcome card with false information, you also can get a cup. <laughs> Just like me. All right. Awesome. Good, good, good. I'm glad you're here this morning. Listen, we've been in Genesis uh, since September, and we just got into the second chapter, which means at this pace, um, my son Peter will have to finish this book. Um, we looked at the first epoch of Genesis, which is the uh, period of time, not a point in time, but a period of time that God created the heavens and the earth. Now, a lot of humans, humans, <laughs> oh, humans, um, humans oftentimes think that out of the seven days of creation, that the climax of those seven days was the sixth day. Why? Because on the sixth day, God created the earth dwelling creatures as well as the most important of all creatures us. We read the seven days of creation. We're like, God created a lot of really cool stuff. It's really cool. It's really neat. And then finally, the sixth day, us, praise God, we showed up. Adam and Eve, all right. And then on the seventh day, God rested, whatever that means. If you were here last week, we studied the seventh day of creation, which is actually... The climax of those seven days. Why? Because on the seventh day, God came into his temple. He came into Eden. And he sat down. Uh, one of the things that we said last week, if, if you weren't here, you got to go back and watch it. It, 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 was, it, was, it was amazing. I was talking. <laughs> Just saying. All right. On the seventh day, God rested, that word Shabbat, which means to go back and to return to the seat of. On the seventh day, God came into the time that he had created on the first day. He came into the atmosphere that he created on the second day. He came into that place where the dry land had been carved out from the water. He came into that place where the sun, the moon, the stars filled the firmament, filled the rakia. He came into this place where the waters were teeming with life and the air was full of singing birds. He came into this place where there were land-dwelling creatures. He came into this place where there were his very 
very own image bearers. And here, within this incredible environment, God came in to his temple and to his sanctuary. And he sat down on the throne in his temple. He sat down, he was seated, and he rested and throned in his new abiding place, Eden. Which brings us to the second epoch of the chapter, Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. You ready? You look right. Oh, are you guys ready? That's better. All right, awesome. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. It says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth. And after they were bara. This is the first time contained within the creation project in the first era, the first seven days, Yahweh Elohim brought about cosmos out of chaos. Cosmos means order. In this first epoch, the Lord is going to come into his blessing. He creates, he creates, he creates, he creates, he creates. He rests, he blesses, and the blessing of God becomes the bridge from epoch one to epoch two. So now, as we begin to move forward in the book of Genesis, we're going to see the blessing of God and God coming into his blessing and partnering with his image bearers, partnering with mankind to steward and to bring about the blessing of God into operation. Epoch 1, he brings about the uh, cosmos out of the chaos, bringing the cosmos into uh, operational order. And now God is going to enter into, with his sons and his daughters, he's going to enter into his blessing whereby partnering with mankind, mankind will begin to steward the blessing of God, bringing it into operation. All right. In Genesis 2, verse 5, it says, this is, this is Moses bringing the camera in. So God has cre- created successfully the heavens and the earth. And now Moses is going to zoom in a little bit. Okay. And this is what it says. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. So what Moses has done is he has, he has stepped back now in time. So in Genesis 2.5, God has not yet created Adam and Eve. This is a point in time. He says, no bush of the field. Bush is translated. um, uh, This word actually is only used two other times in the the entire Old Testament. It refers to as wild brush. He says here, there was no wild brush in the land. And then he continues. And there was no small plant. This word plant is used for general vegetation. This, This is food. So in this point of time, there's no wild brush growing, and there's no food growing. And we see here this no plant and no, no, no bush in the field. This word field is used over and over and over. And this is the Hebrew word, sadeh. In this type and context, sadeh refers to the land that's not claimed by any town or farmer. More important, we see that this sedeh, in this point in time, here is all of this potential. Here is all of this land, okay? But this is land that has no ownership as of yet, and it has not been cultivated. It is unclaimed and uncultivated land. Let's continue on. Genesis chapter 2, verse 6. And in verse 6, Moses begins to describe what he calls a mist. Okay? Your Bible might even say streams. And this mist, the streams, it was going up from the land, and it was watering the whole face of the ground. This word mist 
It's a Hebrew word. It's spelled E-D, okay? It's pronounced aid. This is what Moses says. At this period of time, okay, we see that from the ground, in the ground, are these subterranean fresh waters. We got these underground rivers, but they would only flow where they were channeled. The earth would require digging. The earth would require irrigation and canals, channels where the water could flow profitably. So if we were to actually reread this text that we've just studied up to this point, and we were to paraphrase it to kind of capture actually what's taking place here within the earth, it would read like this. No shrubs or plants were yet growing for food. Why? Because God had not yet sent his rain. And people were not around yet to work the ground for irrigation. So the regular floodings, the inundations, saturated the ground indiscriminately. There's all this potential. There's all this water. But the water isn't being channeled or funneled. So things are not in operation. It's a blessing. You see the blessing of God. But the blessing is not being stewarded. And then he continues to verse 7. It's within this context of a blessed earth that needs working. It needs people that care, that'll work it, that'll steward it, that'll see the full potential, uh, to see the earth step into its full potential. We come to chapter 2, verse 7, where God forms man. Now, this kind of bummed my son Peter out a little bit this morning because he was in the first service and sometimes my preaching bums him out. And you, you said, Dad, you hit pause and you said we're going to circle back. I said, yes, son, that's going to be a different week. What we're actually going to do, remember here, it's within this context that the earth needs to be worked and stewarded, okay? That God creates man. But how did he do it? It'll blow your mind. It is so, it is so awesome. Now, we're not going to talk, we're not going to, we're not even going to read it. We're going to skip verse 7, and what are we going to do? We're going to stay on earth, okay? We're going to stay focused on this piece of land that God is going to abide in, okay? Verse 8, and the Lord God planted, how, how do you plant? And God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And there he put the man whom he had formed. It wasn't the Garden of Eden. There was the earth. There was Eden. And there in Eden, he planted a garden. Now, a garden, we think of a little plot of land out back plow the ground, you put down some squash, some cabbage, some, some things that you never intend on actually eating. You, you plant a lot of things so that they can grow and rot and feed the deer, right? <laughs> Unless you live in my neighborhood. We live in a pretty nice we live in a pretty nice area. I mean, it's not like bling bling or nothing cray cray, but um, like we live in like, we just live up here behind the church. And we've got like three neighbors that are actually gardeners, actually. And I think it's probably around three. And, um, and th their, their garden is interesting. They actually have like greenhouses. And what happens is that sometimes the sun will begin to heat up those, those greenhouses. And and, and what's in those greenhouses spreads a fragrance out into the entire neighborhood, into the entire Newcastle zip code if they had one. 
And I'll tell you what, what those guys are gardening is stuff that you smoke. This is not that kind of gardening, okay, guys? All right, all right. This, this kind of garden is not a little greenhouse, you know, okay? Uh, this, this, this kind of garden is not a little patch of land where you grow car- cabbages. No, no, when we look at the garden here that God planted, we should think of a gigantic country garden, a botanical garden, or something like a bush gardens. Gardens throughout human history are oftentimes featured in palaces or in temples. In the ancient world, gardens were planted with fruit trees and shade trees. Sometimes they contained intricate, complicated, engineered water courses, pools, paths, underwater tunnels. We can see within the record of these ancient temples and the temple gardens that would contain exotic trees, plants, sometimes even animals. Kings would boast of large parts of their cities that were devoted to these gardens. In other words, you would know how great a king was by how great his garden was. Temple complexes sometimes featured gardens that symbolized... Fertility. Fertility provided by the deity. These intricate temple gardens, something in the natural that would testify of their spirit world, that in the natural this is beautiful and colorful and plentiful, and we believe that our gods, our deities, will provide this kind of color, this kind of life, this kind of produce. In fact, the produce that was grown in a lot of these temple gardens was used in offerings to the deities just as the temple flocks and herds were used for sacrificial purposes. Also, when you look at ancient religions, the gods positioned themselves in watery abodes. There's always been something very, very spiritual about water and integrating water and elements of water into the temple. In fact, the Canaanite god, El, um, was known for sitting in a place of a watery abode. He actually lived in waters. We see Ezekiel 28, verse 2, the prophet, he actually talks about this. He says, in the pride of your heart, you say, I am a god. You sit on the throne of a god, and where is it fixed? In the waters, in the seas. Now, here we have Eden. And in Eden is a garden. And we see that it's planted and there's vegetation, but we also see that it's a well-watered place. In fact, when you begin to read the Bible, we see here this first occurrence. There's Eden, and God planted a garden in Eden. But soon... Eden would become synonymous with the garden. So later on in the Bible, you read Eden and you see it and understand it, that it is referring to the garden environment. In the same way that a garden would be attached to a temple, in the same way that a garden would be attached to a palace, we see here in Eden the source of all of these waters And we see that it's here in Eden that God considers his residency. This picture presented to us in Genesis is a garden. And from the garden is a mighty spring that gushes up and out of Eden. And it's channeled through the garden for irrigation purposes. And we see all of these channels serving as these headwaters. And we see four rivers flowing out in various directions as the water exits the garden. Everyone declare with me right now. Eden. It means enjoyment, bliss, pleasure, delight. 
Eden is the bliss-filled temple of God. And it has a garden. It also became the home of Adam and Eve. In essence, this is what God's saying. This is my home. And this is also your home. My home is your home. We come to the next verse, Genesis 2, verse 9. This is an interesting verse. Why? Because this verse says that in the garden are two fascinating trees. Yeah, yep. We'll come back to this verse as well. It'll have its own week. The two trees. Which brings us to verse 10. The earth. Okay. Interesting place. A lot of potential. Needs to be worked. We have the earth. We have Eden. And then we have the garden. Here in verse 10 it says that a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And there it divided and became four rivers. We're going to read of these rivers here coming up, and we're going to look at the translation of what they mean. And, but whenever um, the rivers come up, you're going to recognize some of the rivers. And the big question that always comes up is, hey, Pastor Darren, um, where, where was Eden? Most people believe that because of the rivers that are mentioned, that Eden was somewhere in the Middle East. Unless you're a Mormon, they believe that Eden was in Jacksonville County in Missouri. Yeah, probably not. You know, like, anytime you hear that something holy and sacred originated in America, yeah, probably the wrong religion, okay? Okay. We're going to see these rivers. We're going to see this geography here. And the problem is that as we approach this, we can't just see Eden. We can't just see the garden as this place of earthly existence and try to pinpoint um, the geography of this place. Why? Because Eden had a natural, literal geography, a, a natural, literal planting on earth, but it also had a cosmic geography. We see these four rivers, and they were literal, beautiful, real bodies of water. But as we read and we study here, their description here actually concerns a cosmic role. The river of Eden was this place of God's residency, His abode, and the source of life-giving water for the earth. It flowed through these rivers. Four streams flowed from the temple or the temple palace. They flowed from this place where God on day seven sat down on his throne. So here we have Eden, we have a throne, we have the abode of God, and we have rivers coming up and out of the garden and doing what? Watering the earth. I love Brian Simmons. He wrote a translation, paraphrase, of the, um, the Passion Translation. Apparently, um, the Gateway app removed the Passion Translation um, off the Gateway app. I don't know if you guys heard about You guys hear about this this last week? Yeah, apparently it was, it was too passionate. Okay, the, pas- the Passion Translation is not a word-for-word word translation. It's a paraphrase. And what Brian has done is he approaches the Word of God... Okay, through filters built through Paul and the Pauline letters, through filters of grace. He, 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 he approaches the beautiful storyline of the Bible through, through the eyes of a loving, caring father. And from the passionate heart of a faithful father, he approaches the text. And he is attempting to go from Genesis all the way to Revelation. This is what, this is what Brian says. Speaking of this prophetic, poetic symbolism that exists here. As the one river, we see 
God. He is the one river. Flowing up and out of the garden, it separates into four heads. Rivers are used as metaphors of the Holy Spirit. It is Jesus that gives us the life-giving presence of God. The Hebrew word for river comes from the root word that means to sparkle or to be cheerful. So here we are in paradise. Here we are in this abode of bliss. Here we are in the, in the, in the place of convergence where heaven kisses the earth. And here in this place is a river that comes up and then separates. Verse 11. The name of the first river was the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. Now, there are pla- uh, 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 th- th- this. Th- uh, I did some of the research on this, but how many of you have ever heard of, of Saudi gold? Okay. There's, there's a place in the Middle East. It's literally called the cradle of gold. And so there is a belief that these first two rivers that we're going to look at, there is no actual uh, natural river that we know of with these names. So a lot of guys would say, you got these two rivers, and they were there. They're real rivers, bodies of water, but they dried up. And you can go there, you can find the gold, and you can know that this river once existed, okay? But there's gold. Now, I want you to think of the temple of Moses. I want you to think of the Holy of Holies. I want you to think of, of, of all the symbolism that would be established in the temple. If you want to know what it was like in Eden, if you want to understand the dynamics of Eden, all you have to look to is, is the architecture and design of the temple. Verse 2, and the gold of that land is good. There was also aromatic resin. What does that mean? There was, from this river, what were these smells and fragrances, this, this incense. What does that remind you of? Gold, incense. Okay, wh- what, else, what else was there? Onyx stones. What were these stones used for? The breastplate that the priest would... So you got gold, you've got, um, you've got incense, a fragrance, and you've got the very stones that would be used for the breastplate of the high priest. Is this amazing? I'm like geeking out right now. Ah! Verse 13. The name of the second river was the Gishon. So there's the Pishon, the Gishon, and this is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. Verse 14. The name of the third river was the Tigris, which flows out of Assyria, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Tigris and the Euphrates, we've heard of these. They're known to us. But what about the Pishon and the Gishon? I'll tell you what happened. Pishon left and Gishon went with them. People try to identify these things. They try to find certain canals. But no one has come up with any sort of scientific proof that these rivers ever existed on the earth. Pishon. It literally means overflowing and increase. To leap forth. Okay? The second river was the Gishon, which means to push or to give birth. The third river, the Tigris, means swift an arrow in flight. In the fourth river, the Euphrates, means fruitfulness. Here you have Eden. You have the river of God coming up, stemming out into four rivers, overflow and increase, to give birth, swift an arrow in, fr- in flight, and fruitfulness. This was the river flowing from the residency of God. This was two physical realms together as one realm. And the possibility 
that there were two earthly rivers flowing from Eden along with two heavenly rivers overlapping, coinciding, and also flowing from Eden. Two physical rivers with substance coming from two different places. Two and two. Verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to do what? To sleep. Nope. This is what it says. And the Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to what? To work it. To steward it. To take ownership of it. For here you have the earth that was untilled and there was no ownership. And here you have God create man and he puts it into the ground to work it, to steward it, to see the blessing of God come into its productive order. You have land, you have water, but they're unproductive in their ability to produce food. They need to be worked. There is no irrigation prior to man. The earth But the blessing needs to be brought into productive order. God creates the man, and he puts him in the garden. The garden was not a garden for man, ultimately. This was the garden of God. The prophet Isaiah would say it like this. Isaiah 51, verse 3 the Lord will surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins. But he will make her deserts like Eden, her wastelands like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the sound of singing. Ezekiel, the prophet, he declares, Ezekiel 28 verse 13, You were in Eden, the garden of God. Both times, Eden. God's garden. Not man's, not man's garden. It was God's sanctuary and with it a garden. Ezekiel would say, you were there in Eden. God's garden. And every precious stone adorned you. The carnelian, the chrysolite, the emerald, the topaz, the onyx, the jasper, the lapis, the the lazuli, the turquoise, and the barrel, your settings and mountings, they were made of gold. Speaking of Lucifer. And on the day you were created, they were prepared. The Garden of Eden was not viewed as this cute little garden, but an archetypal sanctuary, the place that God dwells and where man should worship him. And the key to this garden was the presence of God. Here, this garden, this dwelling place of God, it was the source of, yes, waters, but it was the source of all creative forces that flow from the character and nature of God. God sat in his throne in Eden. And that energy and this life-giving force would flow out from the throne of God, from the center of his governing and ruling authority. It would flow up and out from his throne into all of creation and a constant unceasing outflow of mighty power. The mighty God sat in the midst of his garden in perfect union, in perfect relationship. There was no separation between heaven and earth. There was no secular. It was all holy. And everything that God created was created to behold and to reveal and to emanate and to, and to reverberate the very presence of God. That everything 
everything from the, the stones to the trees to the grass to the animals. There was a, there was a reverberation, a, a resonation that we have been created to what? To give and to reveal the glory and the majesty and the mightiness of God. They hear within this place there was no separation. There was no veils. There were no categories. There was no hierarchy. There was dad and his children and they were working together to create and take this place that the Lord had started. This place of Burah to hold and to host a dream into his heart and to speak it into being. To establish to establish a temple and a sanctuary. A place where he could find rest and here within this place we see Eden the dwelling place of God the river of God Revelation 22 the John the beloved would say that where the river of life flows it flows from where from the throne of God so then then what, what, what happened then he didn't just dry up why can't we find Eden where did it go is it just a, de- is it just a de- desolate wilderness now? R- remember, when there used to be a garden, the garden is no more. Well, that's not exactly true. Because just because you can't find Eden on a map doesn't mean that it no longer exists. The throne never moved out of Eden. The throne of God is still in Eden. And God is still seated on his throne and the river of God the river of life the river of creativity the river of might the river of power the river of counsel the river of the sovereignty of the holy of holy still flows from his governing throne his character his nature everything that he is it still flows from his grace it still flows from this place that there is still a literal physical palace and sanctuary and connected to it is a literal physical garden what's interesting is that these prototypes these earthly shadows would start to be established on the earth and the Lord did this to create these archetypes to to create these blueprints and these models by which we would get an idea of how heaven is arranged and we began to get the archetype of the temple and we began to see that that within the temple is a holy of holies and it is separated by a veil and and we begin to see that Moses gets the blueprints for the first temple why where did he get the blueprint he got the very he got the blueprints for the temple from the blueprints of Eden The temple is the same layout as Eden. The same elements, the same fragrances, the same gold, the same majesty, and the same presence of God that was in Eden was in the temple. But in Genesis 1 and 2, we see that God has created a home because he wants to dwell in and with his people. We see that mankind screwed up as mankind tends to do. And instead of trusting God, mankind rebelled against God. But Jesus would say, For my dad so loved the entire earth that he sent me, that whosoever would believe in me would not perish, would not be separated, would have everlasting life. And we see that when Jesus was crucified, The veil in the temple, the veil that separated Eden from unholy people, that veil was torn, symbolic of this reality. Eden is now open. We see in Acts chapter 2, That God comes like a mighty rushing wind. Not a wind. He came like a mighty rushing wind. And it was God himself. God the Holy Spirit comes. He appears as a fire. 
that the same relational glory fire that came upon Mount Sinai and interacted with Moses, where the finger of God came and carved out the ten rhythms of heaven onto two stone tablets. That same terrifying fire that freaked out all the Israelites came into that room with 120 men, women, and children. And the glory fire of God's relational presence came up above all 120 as pillars of fire. And it came up, and then what did it do? It did not come in for a visitation. It was that glory relational Eden came like a fire and was impregnated in all 120 of them as the throne of God came in and settled into them. And now they would begin to transform and grow what Paul would say is the fruit of the glorious Holy Spirit without even trying. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and... (laughs) Self-control. I've got control of myself. I don't have to sin anymore. I'm not even trying. I'm not even trying to be gooder. I'm just becoming better. I'm not even trying. I'm not trying to be religious. I'm not trying to be a Christian. I'm not trying to get people to like me. All I know is the throne of God's ruling authority and grace is in me and he said my home is your home your home is my own in him I live in him I move in him I have my being he's made his home in me I am a temple I am a temple of the Holy Spirit there's no more separation and he's unleashed us onto the earth He's unleashed us onto the earth to be oracles of this glorious gospel, which means the good news. Which means that all of humanity has been created as image bearers. And you don't have to pay for your own salvation. You could never pay for it. And you don't have to earn this salvation. You could never earn it. Your self-righteousness, what you call holiness, is just filthy rags. He's not looking for your good performance. He's looking for you to be honest. He's looking for you to be humble. He's looking for a people that say, I don't have my act together. I don't want to pretend. I I, I don't want to perform. I want to be a son, a daughter who dwells in Eden, who works the land. And it is written, there was the earth, but there wasn't life. Why? Because the ground didn't have a people that had a revelation of ownership and kingdom stewardship. The church just wants to sit around in hammocks and call that rest. Oh, I'm just in a season of rest. How long has that been going for you? 20 years. They turned out the lights. They took away my car. They turned out my water. But I'm just in a season of rest. Bro, you don't under, you don't, you're, you're defining rest the way that Americans define rest. You're defining rest through this Western American. No, no, no. What does kingdom rest looks like? It looks like you sit on the throne of governing and authority. And from a revelation of where you are seated in Christ. You take ownership and you steward the possibilities until the possibilities produce. Some of you, you got pride because you're like, I don't drink and I don't smoke and I don't chew and I don't hang out with those who do. But you are doing nothing to use your influence, to use your finances, to use your your family, to use who God created you to be, to steward and to massage these kingdom realities. Some of you, you're waiting. You think you're waiting on God, but you are deceived. You are deceived. You're waiting on the next revival. You're waiting for the next harvest. You're waiting for the next outpouring. Listen. The earth received the greatest inpouring ever. Holy Spirit came 2,000 years ago and poured himself into us. 
We are not waiting on him. He is waiting on us. Not for some sort of new revelation from some new YouTube prophet who will sell you some $5,000 uh, e-course. You don't need an e-course. You need Genesis chapter 1. Barashi Elohim bara. In the beginning, mighty God, the one who is worthy to be worshipped created the heavens and the earth and then he came in to his creation and he sat down on his throne and in this place he empowered mankind to take this temple to steward it to take this garden and to expand it Charles Darwin lied to you He did not create you a Neanderthal just to show up because your daytimer said it was Sunday at 11 o'clock. Sit your bum bum in a chair, check it off the list, put something into your 401k, live, drink, be married for one day we die. He has created you as an image bearer, an oracle of solutions, an agency of hope. He has knit us together, the ecclesia, with power and potential to collaborate and not think that our ideas are stupid just because they came from our mind. Can you still hear me? Stop separating sacred and secular. Stop with your divisions already. Stop saying, I go to a secular job, but I go to a Christian church. Stop it. Stop thinking that way. What has been seated inside of you? Eden. And wherever you go, there's an opportunity to cultivate, to till the land, and to see transformation come to businesses and education and to government, to entertainment, to see transformation come to the sciences. Why? Because there are a people that understand the grace of God, and they are taking their life seriously. Some of them are getting degrees, and some of them are actually reading books and some of them are, are having fascinating conversations with fascinating people. Why? Because they understand God has created me to garden. You say, Pastor Darren, you don't understand my situation. There's nothing I can do. You've been lied to. As long as your heart's beating, there's always something you can do. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Don't let him steal this revelation of your identity. That no matter your limitations... You are a photograph of Father God. You are an image bearer of Father God. You have the ability to articulate and to represent something. You have the ability to resonate. You have the ability to worship God in that weird way that only you can do. Worship is going to be transforming in the church because worship is going to go from a place where we sing songs on Sunday to a place where all of our being is resonating, reverberating and interacting with the throne of God's ruling grace. Let me tell you something. When the, when the church begins to truly worship, truly live, we won't have to teach evangelism courses anymore. When the church learns the revelation of true worship, we won't have to teach missions classes anymore. Why? Because we will literally be on fire in the fire of his ruling governmental glory grace. We'll be communicating the aspects of the kingdom everywhere we go. The message will be who we are, and who we are will be the message. He's not looking for worship. He's looking for worshipers who will resonate in spirit and in truth. If you're a worshiper, would you stand up to your feet? We've been lied to. We've been told that there's no Eden any longer. But I'm telling you the truth. There is an Eden. It's the temple of God. It does exist. And it is open for you to reside. His home is your home. Your home 
is his home. Yahweh Elohim, worthy of our praise, our worship, our affection, our partnership, so we can co-create with him. Let's lift up our hands in this room. Hallelujah.